thank you all for attending. I'm absolutely delighted to announce our full year results for the 12 months ended 31st of March. How can I be anything but delighted, of course? Um, I'm going to take you through a quick summary of the year, hand over to Ollie, who will take you through the numbers in a bit more detail, along with our ESG numbers. And then I'll come back and give you a business overview, a sense of where we're heading, the next stage of growth, really, and an outlook for the current financial year that we're in. So uh, without any further ado, let me get started. So um, obviously, super happy to tell you about our uh, revenues up 62% to 51.1 million. A part of that is organic like for like revenue growth of 19% ahead of our 10 to 15% stated targets. Adjusted EBITDA up 87% to 7.1 million. And on an organic like for like basis, that's growth of 31% as well. So, so great there. EPS at 6.1 pence, up 69 pence. Ollie will talk to you in a bit more detail around how the EPS calculation actually takes place. Um, um, and, and we'll show you some adjustments actually to, to that. Um, cash conversion incredibly strong. I guess you know we're pretty old-fashioned here. We um, we like to uh, make profit and convert that into cash, and it's a sort of old-fashioned sense of the world, really. Um, but we're a cash conversion at 106% and 5.7 million cash at bank as of 31st of March. On the ESG side, 53% workforce growth, over 500 employees today. A real sense of scale in the group today. 48% of our workforce are women. What's great is, is on the planet side, our, our, um, our carbon emissions per million pounds of revenue is down 23%, if, you know, beginning the process of decoupling economic growth from impacts on the planet. Um, we, we, you'll know we give 1% of our time um, to, um, to causes that we care about. And, and last year, we donated 1,654 hours of which, which is up about 82% on the year before. Uh, returning to revenue, and the sectors we operate in, you possibly all know by now that we operate predominantly in the public services sector on a stat basis. 71% of the revenue came from that sector with 29% from commercial. On a pro forma basis, that's more like 75% from public and 25% from commercial. Breaking that down further, 20% of our revenue came from central government, 24% from local government, 9% from health, 4% from education, 14% from not-for-profit and, and the commercial, as I say, 29%. And we'll, we'll explain some of that in a bit more detail in a, in a bit. I guess you can't talk to the year ending 31st of March 2021 without talking to COVID, which was obviously the dominant factor in the year, really. Um, it's worth stepping back and actually saying that COVID hit our risk register in January of 2020. And actually, in February, we set out to write down a set of values or principles that we would use to run the company. As you recall, if you go back to that time, kind of March, um, March 2020, you know, we didn't know what we were facing. Nobody knew what we were facing. Nobody had dealt with this um, as an issue before. There's no books to read. Um, so we, we decided that we would write down a set of principles that would guide all of our actions. And we distributed these principles to our leadership teams. Um, so to take you through those. Number one was to do all we could to retain our workforce. Um, you know, we are a people business and inevitably there will be a recovery. Um, what we wanted to do was to, to, um, to be well placed to take advantage of that recovery when it came. Um, and, you know, as it turned out, you know, with the, the, but this we didn't know at the time, as it turned out, our, our business actually grew immediately during the period. Um, but we didn't know that when we wrote this down. Second thing was to favor the health of our employees over any client pressure to work on site. And I know at the time, um, a couple of clients were pretty upset with that, but actually eventually saw that we were, we were doing the right thing. Um, certainly, we um, had everyone working from home from the first week of March, whereas the government actually said issued the work from home or stay at home order, if you like, on the 23rd of March. Um, we decided that we would support. It was a time of great uh, challenge for most people. Um, and we decided that we would not add to people's stress. And so we, we, we decided not to make anybody redundant, including people like office managers. Um, we kept them on full pay and asked them to sort of volunteer in their local community if they felt comfortable doing so. And then the fourth thing was, you know, thinking back to 2008, 2009, we said that we would do everything we could to avoid taking any government funds at all. We didn't take a penny of furlough. You know, many companies took furlough and then had to give it back. We never took any in the first place because we just knew that we wanted that commercial freedom. In terms of the work that we did, really quite impactful work. One I'll pick up on here, which is the NHS home testing service launched in eight days. We stood up a service in eight days 
to enable NHS staff right at the very beginning of the pandemic to um, uh, test at home. So many people were going off sick, unable to attend work because they had minor symptoms that could be COVID. Um, and so by actually we, we distributed a million test kits in the first 12 weeks of the service um, to enable NHS to return to work if they didn't in fact have COVID. And many other examples from deaf, um, food for vulnerable connecting um, vulnerable uh, shielding residents to priority delivery slots with supermarkets and lots of other programs like that. So we're really pleased that the part we played um, in the COVID-19 emergency, particularly at the very beginning. Um, you know, you'll know from, you know, from everything that we've said already that the reason we exist is to deliver great impact in the work that we do. You know, these are just some of the examples of some of the work that we've done across the board where we, we really do believe we're delivering great impact. I mean, very recently, DEFRA, where we're working to make the process of moving food products between Northern Ireland and the rest of the United Kingdom as efficient and smooth as possible. That's obviously been a major issue, um, impacting obviously lots of things in Northern Ireland at the moment. And certainly we've built a system pretty quickly, actually, um, over the last couple of months. Um, we demoed it to George Eustace the other day. He was delighted with the way that it worked. That's now gone to Alpha with a view towards rolling that out to live very, very quickly. And that actually becoming the foundation of the, how the UK runs import and export processes. So really interesting, exciting and impactful work. NHS Jobs on the other side, which is a single jobs platform across the entire NHS. Um, obviously, the NHS has challenges in terms of recruiting staff, you know, many, many vacancies. This went on public beta a couple of weeks ago, I think it was and already 4,000 jobs up and running on that platform, so really helping to address some of the staff challenges that the NHS face. This is typical of the kind of work that we look to do. We look to make an impact in the work we do. We look to be paid. We look to make profits, obviously, from the work that we do, but we look to make sure that when we do it, we deliver some sort of societal level impact as well. So that's where the kind of impactful work responsibly delivered, like uncoupling um, carbon emissions from economic growth and doing it at scale, because that scale is so important to us because the bigger we are, the more we get to impact um, citizens' lives, patients' lives, and so on. You know, obviously, we, we get to pit, um, work on bigger challenges, bigger projects, and so on. So our market, we are, we, we are in the software and IT services market, the SITS market, um, which is was worth, according to uh, Tech Market View, was worth $51.8 last year, of which just about $12 billion comes from um, the public sector. Um, our clients span, as I said earlier, central government, local government, health, um, education, and other public services sectors. Obviously, we still do have a strong commercial business and, and intend to retain a strong commercial business. So 25% of our revenue is on a pro forma basis, as I mentioned earlier, coming from, from commercial sector clients like The Times, Dow Jones, uh, Cargill, and many others. A couple more slides from me, um, and then I'll hand over to Ollie. So first, let's look at the organic growth story in the year in FY21. 19% uh, like for like organic growth. We stated already that well, our target range is 10 to 15. So obviously we exceeded that quite considerably. The story has always been about bringing smaller companies together to help them work together to win larger deals. And that's evidence with a few things here. So um, 11 customers worth more than a million pounds build in FY21 versus six in 2020. Four contracts signed worth more than uh, three million pounds in FY21 versus none in 2020. And actually, if you go through the multi-decade history, collective multi-decade history of the companies in the group, only th they've signed only three, three million pound plus deals in that entire time. It's now become a regular thing. And in fact, in Q1, we've signed another, at least one um, deal of that value already in Q1 as well. And that's reflected in the average spend per customer, which is going up dramatically. So 119,000 in 2020 versus 176,000 in uh, 2020, FY21. Um, moving on to acquisitive growth. So great acquisitions. We recognize 6.3 million revenue from those three acquisitions on a statutory basis, 16.1 million actually on a, on a pro forma basis from those companies. But what's interesting, this is taking that 12.1 billion pound public services, software and IT services market and cutting it in three different ways. So the first one, the one you see on the left here, kits, um, if you look at prior to the acquisition of kits, we were playing only in the solutions and consulting segments, so really roughly a quarter of the market. Um, kits, which is, is known for running live services on a managed service basis, opens out that operation segment, which is effectively opened out. You know, it means that we're operating now in three quarters of that 12 billion pound market, but whereas we were in roughly a quarter before. 
Um, Arthur Lee, you know, obviously what's happening is there's, there's old technologies which are, are slowly, uh, which are declining and then new technologies, things like AWS, um, Microsoft Azure, Google Cloud Platform, for example, that's the segment that's growing. Arthur Lee really strengthened our Microsoft credit, um, capability. And in fact, post uh, acquisition of Arthur Lee, we were able to achieve Microsoft Gold Partner status. And we can, you know, we continue to leverage that as a consequence of that acquisition. So really strengthen that. And then different, the acquisition of different put us into, this is segmenting by central local health and so on. And as you can see, they're roughly a sixth of the market in health, which we were sort of dabbling on the edges of before, but really we're bang in the middle of that now. And in fact, we announced last week that we uh, appointed Noel Gordon as strategic advisor to the group. Noel was previously, um, up until very recently, on the board of NHS England chaired NHS Digital, so really connects us and helps us to really craft that value proposition um, in the healthcare sector as it gets even more interesting with personalized healthcare outcomes and so on. So really great acquisitions that really, you know, both added obviously revenue, profitability, but also strategic importance as well. Uh, great organic growth. And uh, I guess on that note, I'll hand over to Ollie. Thanks, Neil. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks very much for joining us today. So I'm going to run through our financial and ESG results. Um, as you know, we're a very purposeful company um, and we always seek to uh, link profit with purpose, uh, hence why I'm, I'm reporting these, uh, the, the two different sets of data together today. So first of all, we'll start with some financial results. Neil's touched on these, so uh, an exceptionally strong year with revenue growth of 62% up to 51.1 million, uh, including like for like organic growth of 19% with the balance coming from acquisitions in the year and a, and a full year of acquisitions from the prior year coming through. That translated into adjusted EBITDA of 7.1 million, up 87% year on year. And pleasing to see that there was an improvement across the business in terms of EBITDA margin as a result of that growth translating into profit. So we saw EBITDA margin at 14%, which is around the number that we were targeting by 2023. It's great to have got there early, uh, up from 12% in the, the year before. That fell through into adjusted profit after tax of £5 million in the year. In terms of that from a from an EPS perspective, that delivered 6.1p per share, up from 3.6p in the prior year. And I'll take you through a little reconciliation of that uh, in a few slides time. Cash, uh, we saw very strong cash conversion in, in the period uh, of 106%, translating into cash reserves at, at the year end of 5.7 million and a net debt position of 7.3 million. Uh, during the period, we borrowed uh, additional money from HSBC to uh, fund certain acquisitions. I'll talk you through that as well in a little while. We finished the year incredibly strongly um, uh, and entered the new year with a very healthy backlog of work. Uh, so 39 million um, versus 15 million in, in the prior year um, and, and giving us great confidence in, in the year ahead. Uh, in terms of ESG results, it's worth starting with the fact that we launched an ESG committee this year to sit alongside our remuneration and our audit committees. Um, so real focus from the from the PLC board around this. We think we're one of the first companies to do that um, uh, in, in terms of some of the statistics coming out of this year. So our workforce continues to grow rapidly and we're providing decent, well-paid opportunities across the group. All of our employees are paid a living wage. In fact, our median salary is almost three times um, the UK living wage. Last year, we invested 24 million into employee compensation and benefits and we created 73 new jobs. We continue to strive for a diverse and inclusive workforce and are proud that 48% of our workforce are women in an industry traditionally dominated by men. Uh, we have targets in place to close the diversity, equality and inclusion gaps for underrepresented employees at every level within the business. From the 18 key gaps that we measure, we made progress in closing 72% of them last year. We recognise we have work to do when it comes to closing the pay gap and reaching minority ethnic talent. And this becomes a focus for us going forward. Um, connected to our desire for a diverse and accessible tech industry, we continue to invest in diverse talent pipeline through our community investment and community engagement programs. Through our 1% pledge last year, we managed to support 50 charities and ran our second eight week incubator program for five young digital entrepreneurs from underrepresented backgrounds. Our employees supported these efforts by donating over 1,600 hours to projects within their communities. In terms of climate, we invested heavily in properly understanding our environmental impact last year by working in partnership with Emitwise to massively increase the scope of what we measure 
account for and ultimately offset. The good news is that we're starting to decouple our economic growth from environmental degradation. As Neil mentioned, and our per one million pound revenue carbon emissions ratio were down 23% year on year. Finally, we've began to look at the societal impact that we make through the work we deliver to clients. We've got big ambitions around looking at the sort of positive impacts that we have. But at the moment, at the first stage of the project, we've got an agreed framework for clients in sectors that we that do not align with our values. And last year, less than 2% of our revenue came from sectors classified as controversial by the International Finance Corporation and ethical investment criteria. Moving on, just so in terms of the year's performance, how did we deliver against uh, the commercial and impact targets that we set out a year ago? So we set out some targets through to 2023, gave ourselves three years to achieve those in terms of how we're tracking. So we set out to achieve 10 to 15% organic revenue growth per annum. And this year we delivered 19% and Q1 is tracking ahead of the target. In terms of cash flow, we wanted to see circa 70% of operating profit drop through into positive cash flow. Uh, and obviously, as I mentioned, achieved 106% this year. We're looking to achieve um, a progressive dividend policy at about 15 to 20% of net income. This year, we set, started that journey with our uh, first uh, uh, dividend, an interim dividend of 0.2p, and we've just announced a final dividend of 06 And so we're working to increase that over the course of the next couple of years. We were looking to make it earnings enhancing acquisitions to add more than £35 million pounds worth of revenue over the three-year period. Well, in just one year, we delivered three acquisitions uh, with a pro forma revenue of £16.1 million. And we wanted to, uh, all this while, keep and uh, maintain leverage below one times EBITDA. And, and that's the, definitely the case at the moment. And finally, we had an aim to achieve run rate revenue of £100 million by March 23 and deliver that 12 to 14% EBITDA. Well, we've noted that the EBITDA percent margin is at 14% already, um, and we're well on track to achieving that £100 million in that, in that next couple of years with consensus uh, was at 643 I think has moved up over 70 today, I think to 71 and a half from memory. So uh, well on track. As a result of being so well on track with that, Neil's going to talk through an extension of the commercial vision to 2025 um, as we set, aim to set ourselves some longer term goals. In terms of um, ESG um, uh, and how we did on our ESG vision for 2023, so the main, the main focus for the year was really around getting the processes and systems in place to allow us to really track and monitor our ESG performance. So we spent a lot of time understanding the diversity and inclusion metrics across our group. We work with the MITWISE, as I talked about, to look at the planet and equally from a community perspective, tracking and, uh, and monitoring all the work that we're doing within the community. We made yeah, great progress, as I said, around people, closing 72% of the gaps. In terms of leaving no trace, yeah, we have offset all of our carbon for 2020 and 2021. And then in terms of community, we've kick-started 602 careers today and what we mean by that is one unique beneficiary from our community action or community investment program who has benefited from at least one hour of skills training so that was uh how we performed against targets here's some some more financial data just around the year you can see here the the, the revenue growth that we've achieved over the last three years from up from 22 uh, in 19 to 51 today um, and equally from an EBITDA perspective we've seen ever improving margins as, as, as we uh, as we grow revenue Here's a, just a quick bridge to look at adjusted EBITDA through to profit after tax. You'll note depreciation at 835. That includes about 660K of lease costs. So it's the sort of IFRS 16 impact on the numbers um, for your reference there. In terms of cash flow, as we'd said, it was a strong cash profile. So 7.1 EBITDA translated into 5.1 million of adjusted operating cash flows. We then spent 10.8 million and new acquisitions. Some of that was funded through that cash and then £8 million worth of additional borrowing in the year to take our uh, total borrowings to £13 million and a net debt position of £7.3 million. Worth noting that the, the facility we have with HSBC was extended from £5 million to £20 million during the period. And so we have a further £7 million undrawn for further acquisitions in the future. Note that we didn't need to use it for the, the nudge acquisition that we announced last week, uh, which was, was was funded solely from cash uh, reserves and, and cash generated uh, post period end. In terms of revenue breakdown, just a quick split here. We, we've shown this data historically, which is just to show the makeup of our revenue and to show that over 70% comes from recurring and repeat customers and shows the sort of sticky nature of our client base, but equally pleased to see you know 23 percent of, of new coming in, in in the public sector, five percent in, in new commercial.
In terms of the statutory PL, here's the, the detail here, I'll leave it for you to, to have a look at in detail. And obviously it's available on, on, on the RNS that went out this morning. I guess my particular focus is around that that loss before tax and, and explaining that and why we don't think it's necessarily an appropriate measure of the performance of the group. Um, again, this is a, a similar table to we produced previously. So um, in terms of taking that from a from, from a statutory loss to our adjusted profit before tax of 5.9 million, you can see um, the significant amounts of amortization relating to our the acquisitive nature of the group, nothing to do with underlying performance there. And then the loss on fair value movement of contingent consideration is a big number. And that relates to basically overperformance of companies against original targets uh, in the case where we had earnouts in place. We are moving away, as announced this morning, I'm moving away from financial earnout related deals. So we anticipate this number sort of dropping off and falling away. We've only got two earnouts still running that have some financial criteria, and we don't anticipate there being a large impact in 2022. Uh, then you've got adjustment for share-based payments and then exceptional costs relating to acquisitions, taking you down to the 5.9 million PBT. In terms of EPS, here's a little reconciliation as mentioned earlier. So uh, the weighted average shares in issue was 63 million. Um, the maximum shares to be issued under share options is 4.4 million shares. And then we've got further shares to issue to satisfy consideration or contingent consideration to be payable over the course of the next couple of years. That gives you an EPS of 6.1 versus 3.6. Uh, in reality, the shares to be issued for contingent consideration is full significantly based on the current share price and where the shares sit today. As of last week, when we were at about £2.65, that resulted in that 13.7 million became 3.8 million. So it has a very positive impact on EPS as we go forward. And then the final slide for me is really just to look at the balance sheet. Um, you'll note significant increases in goodwill and then tangible assets as a result of the acquisitions. And the only other numbers I wanted to highlight here were the contingent consideration number. So that relates to the, sh the shares to be issued uh, and is non-cash and equally deferred tax is all non-cash and will unwind over the next few years. So in terms of sort of balance sheet strength, the current ratio of 1.6 times, meaning we're in a good healthy position as we go into 2022. That is it from me. Back to you now. Thank you. Um... Great. I want to take you through really an overview of the business and, and, and actually some pretty bold moves that we're, we're making next to further drive the, the, the growth of, of the business moving forwards. So I want to take you back, I guess, to our beginning through to our present into our future. And, um, you know, uh, we, we came to market uh, and became a real company really on December 4th, 2018. Um, we started with a, a, a set of beliefs, really. Those beliefs were um, that large software teams were a thing of the past, that um, in order to deliver great outcomes and great projects, um, you needed a, a multidisciplinary approach, and actually most small companies rarely had the full spectrum of disciplines required. Uh, and, of course, that business could be a force for good in the world, something that you've seen as, a, as a, an ongoing theme from us from the very beginning and probably see us carrying on with. You know, if you look at where we are today, 51.1 million revenue, um, higher than that on a pro forma basis. I think what Oli just said was consensus. I haven't seen this morning, but 70 odd million um, consensus consensus for FY22. Um, we've got end to end capabilities. We now operate across local government, central government, health, um, higher education, not for profits, housing, and all the uh, um, arts and heritage, and a full spectrum of uh, public services. We're pretty much the only company that there's the only modern company that operates across that spectrum of clients um, with great value proposition across all uh, alongside um, that end-to-end that -end kind of capability from treasury green book business cases right the way through to running live services like rural payments agencies, um, payment platform or um, NHS jobs. And I think as a consequence of that, you know, when we step back and look at what we have in place and what our opportunity is, there's really an opportunity for us to sort of truly simplify our offer, create a, sing, a, a set of integrated client value propositions across the markets that we operate in and launched under a single new brand. So not the panoply. I mean, the panoply was great. It was an impressive collection. Now we have to move from an impressive collection to an impressive company um, and one that really can capitalize on the market opportunity in front of us, which is enormous and growing. And as a consequence of that, really take us to that next stage of our growth in our journey. At the time, you know, many companies, I guess, reach a certain scale and then almost lack the ambition really to go again. And this is our next 
for us, this is we, we almost think of this as our as our next IPO, our, our way to really grow to the next level and go through that kind of into the one billion pound valuation and beyond. So really excited about this. We will launch this new power brand in September 2021. And, you know, I think we've got lots to come from there. As a consequence of that, we'll be able to achieve B Corp certification. We're targeting um, that we get there by um, 2023. Um, it's very difficult for us, even though we have everything in place and probably we could do it today. The challenge that we've got is we've got so many legal entities with all the acquisitions that we've made. We simplify down to a single UK P&L, single UK brand, much fewer number of legal entities than it actually makes our are achieving B Corp certification um, much more realistic. Um, and so we, we've put that down as a, as a goal for us as well. So yeah, really, really excited about this. Alongside that, this, this, this statement, really impactful digital transformation, responsibly delivered at scale. Let me unpack that. Um, so impactful digital transformation is about radically improving the services that truly matter. You know, there's things that I talked to you about, the NH Northern Ireland borders, we all know the issue there. NHS jobs, the, the issues there, the work we've done with um, Department for Culture, Media and Sport around protecting children from online harm. You know, these are all great projects. They're, they're, they're great projects. They're, they Commercially, they make a lot of sense. Um, but they're also great, meaningful, impactful projects. And that's kind of where we want to spend most of our time. Responsibly delivered is about those things like decoupling economic growth from harm to the planet, around kickstarting digital careers for people, around really building a sustainable future for all. And then, of course, that scale. And, and, and you know, that's about our acquisitive organic growth. But scale is important to us for many reasons. One is it delivers great shareholder value, as you, you know, as you've already seen. Um, but also for us, it means that we get to have bigger conversations about the impact that we think we can have. We've got 500 people aligned to making a difference across the spectrum of skills. And I think if we bring all that, you know, when we bring all that together, it means that we can solve bigger and bigger and bigger challenges and have more and more impact on, 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 on the communities and societies, patients around us, around us and so on. So alongside that, this sort of adds to our 2023 vision that we posted before. We've had to do this because we're very close to achieving our 2023. We had set, us, set ourselves a set of goals um, for March of 23. We're very close to getting there. So we started thinking about kind of what comes next. And so we've we've um, updated those for our vision for 2025. So this means that by March of 25, it calls for us to be a run rate, 200 million pound revenue company. And of that, really to become a top 20 public sector supply by March 25 on a run rate basis. That top 20 status requires us to have 150 million or so in public services. And again, it gives us a, a bigger seat at the table, a bigger influence and, and, and really drives that kind of desire to make the difference that we want to. Continue to deliver 10 to 15% organic revenue, continue to make further earnings enhancing acquisitions to make the revenue goal, but also to add capabilities or add depth of capability where we, where we already have it. Um, to ensure that at least 70% of operating profit drops through to positive cash flow. You saw in, the, in, in FY21, 106% cash conversion ratio. To deliver that progressive dividend policy, you saw us just under 10% fair dividend, just under 10% of net income in, um, in, in FY21 and, and head towards that kind of 15 to 20%. To halve the, the 21 gaps that we've identified across the representation pay and inclusion gaps that we have, uh, particularly around uh, um, inclusion for employees from under underrepresented backgrounds. We really want to focus double down on that. This is a tough goal, uh, but one that we're pretty determined to get um, to, to achieve, um, but also to achieve net zero by March of 25. And a, a, a lot of larger competitors that we have have set goals of like net zero by 2040 or whatever. I think we can be substantially more um, ambitious than that. And to kickstart 5,000 digital careers between now and, and, and 2025, you'll recall we did 600 in FY21. So really excited to, to announce these new goals, announce that we're moving to, towards a new brand. In terms of current trading, so um, you, you'll have seen that we announced that um, we'd won around £18.6 million worth of new contracts in the quarter, a record quarter for us, of which 16 and a half is recognisable in FY22. We came into the year with £39 million booked for the year so that at those two together at them would come to 55.5 million obviously with three quarters to go so um, hence 
we were able to say that we are able to deliver the, the, what was on Friday, the FY23 consensus expectations in FY22 itself. As of Friday, we were significantly ahead of market expectations. And then the last thing, I guess, is the acquisition of Nudge Digital. Really important, just uh, closed last week. Um, really important, very small, but very important because um, we see uh, the NHS working towards an agenda of um, uh, personalized healthcare, individual outcomes, uh, which involves working much more closely with pharmaceutical companies than the kind of historic model, which is here's a disease, here's a drug, everyone takes it. A much more personalized um, situation, personalized outcomes based on genomics and so on. Uh, so, huge opportunities for us. And so, by having a reputation in pharmaceuticals and a reputation in, um, in NHS, um, you'll, you'll see that we appointed Noel Gordon um, last week as well, or formally announced the appointment of, of Noel Gordon last week, who up until very recently was a, a non exec director at NHS England and um, chaired NHS Digital to really help us carve out that value proposition that we think is really going to be a platform for growth in the future. So uh, that's it from us. I'm very, very happy to take any questions. And we have a question here that says, are there any specific areas you're considering for your acquisitive growth? Yeah, there's a number of areas. I think we, um, you know, there are there are still gaps in in, in our portfolio, um, particularly around data. I think there's a there's a play to be had around data. Um, things like we see big programs of work in ERP implementation in local government. Um, so there's you know obviously significant um, uh, opportunities around that as well, um, and, and many other areas. In addition, there are segments. You know, we can break further down the segments of central government, of local government, and so on, and, and find areas where we're not. As strong as we'd want to be so there are there are many many areas that we can continue to grow in. we have a great pipeline um, we've just started um, another origination process just very recently and that's showing good um, the, the top of the funnel is, is is pretty pretty strong thank you and there seem to always be a significant number of adjustments to profit share-based payments are essentially an element of employee compensation Owing to the acquisitive nature of the group, it seems likely there will always be restructuring costs, and thus these are not exceptional for your company, but ongoing and regular. Um, I'll say that one, Simon. Well, that one, Ollie. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so we are in a. Yeah, we are. We have set ourselves out as being an acquisitive business, um, uh, but I guess what we're trying to provide is as much transparency around the numbers as possible. So. Um, yeah, we've got all of the data that's available for people to look at and 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 make some decisions about how they want to uh, to to, uh, to to take that data and analyze it. So it's all there and available. In terms of um, some of the big adjustments, uh, there's always going to be amortization charges uh, because of the nature of the accounting associated with acquisitions. But it, but again, um, yeah, that's a change in the policy, in, 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 a bit of a change in accounting policies, which means you have to recognize. Um, goodwill associated with acquisitions in, in intangibles rather than all in goodwill now. And previously, you would just review the performance of a business and decide whether the investment effectively was impaired. Um, that's no longer the case. And you have to write down some of the value of those investments uh, every year now. Um, doesn't doesn't reflect the underlying performance. In an old world where you didn't have to do that, we wouldn't have had any impairment this year. So, um, uh, And then in terms of the the the... the, the uh, the fair value of consideration point again that that um, is a legacy as a result of the acquisitions we've made historically. So historically, we've made acquisitions with um, a high earn out. So we've paid a, a proportion up front, and then based on performance, there is a further and additional consideration payable based on how well the businesses perform. At the point we buy the business, we have to make an estimate of how big uh, that future earn out consideration will be. Um, and obviously, sometimes there's a two year, there's been a two year horizon on that. So it really is sort of a slightly finger in the air. Um, and if we under uh, slightly under forecast how a business is going to deliver, then that results in additional uh, a charge through the P&L. Uh, as, um, so, but again, it, it's uh, non non cash related. Um, in terms of share based payments, again, the, yeah, those are those are in there. Yes, uh, appreciate that they um, 
form part of uh, the remuneration for our staff. They're one of the reasons why we think we will continue to attract and retain great staff as we grow. And I think in, uh, yeah, we can continue to use that uh, as, a, as a way to, um, to impact staff equally. You know, that there is um, all of those shares are disclosed in terms of the fully diluted position. So you can get a, a sense of, of the impact of that longer term on, on the group. Just to, just to add to that, I mean, if you look at FY21, um, the, the loss on fair market, fair value movement of contingent consideration was just under 4.3 million. Um, the new acquisitions that we're making are, um, are, are, don't have any earn out at all. Um, so they are, you know, the most recent one was 35% cash, 65% shares. Um, there is a clawback on those shares, but that exclusively based upon um, the key individuals staying with the group through the period, through through up to a three year period. Um, so in effect, those there's two more, I think, only two more acquisitions which are still running through an earn out structure. Uh, but once they're through, which is end of this, this year, year. End, yeah, end, end of, of year. One, one in eight, one in H one and one in H two this year. So what, once they're through, there'll be no more of those. Um, that that line won't exist anymore. Um, because of the changing nature of the, the acquisitions. Thank you. Although there seems much to like with the panoply, a key issue I have is the issue of share dilution. For the full year 2020, the number of shares is 48.2 million. Full year 21, it's 63.8 million. In the 9th of June issue of Shares RNS, it was stated that there are 81.9 million shares in issue. Thus, acquisition contingent consideration seems to be providing monstrous dilution. I think the way to look at this is all around earnings per share. So, yes, uh, there will be further dilution because as we make further acquisitions, and yes, there are shares that are still to be issued um, uh, under existing deals that we've done. But every time we make acquisitions, we're adding revenue and EBITDA to the business and they are earnings enhancing. So they're driving up um, EPS um, further. So as you can see, we um, yes, the number of shares have gone up year on year, but we've driven EPS up. And I think in terms of this year's, the latest analyst expectations there for EPS to be um, up at about 10p, I think, um, for, for the current year. So uh, yes, there are shares being issued, but but effectively the profit per share number is is, is increasing significantly as well. Yeah, just to add to that, EPS is our magic number. You want to assess what we do um, and how we're performing, then look on an EPS basis. The slide 22 that Ollie took you through, um, the adjusted earnings per share. I mean, in there you'll see that the, that, yeah, that 6.1 is pence per share is based upon 13.7 million further shares to be issued, but actually the way that the deals were structured, um, it, that was at the, it was at the higher of the current price or, um, or the, um, the, the price at which the deals were, um, were signed. And um, that would be at £2.65 as of 31st of March, that would be down to 3.8 um, million shares to be issued, which would actually take EPS um, to 6.9, um, so what we've done here is, is shown an absolutely prudent um, position um, as opposed to the realistic position, which is more like 6.9. Thank you. And what sort of data businesses are you looking to acquire? Um, in, in effect, um, government has lots of data that it's looking to gain insight from. Um, and I think we're looking for organisations that understand how to do that, how to do that in an ethical way. Um, and how to drive the kind of the, the, the data insights that that, um, that effectively mean efficiencies go up um, and, and our citizens get better outcomes. Thank you. And that's the end of questions. Neil, do you have any closing remarks? Um, I, only to say and, and, and publicly state for the record, really, that, um, you know, I'd like to thank all of our staff for their immense effort. Um, and as many of you here will have also experienced, um, it, it's been pretty tough. Uh, for for many people, either working or living in shared accommodation with with you know trying to work on the end of a bed or whatever it might be, um, or trying to um, tr trying to homeschool children while trying to work, or battling loneliness. Um, you know, we really just like to thank our people for um, their work that's enabled us to present these results to you today. So uh, so thank you to them.